Hello, I'm Dame Juliana Lacanante de Navarra, and I'm going to talk about our terminology, what we commonly use, uh, what period manuals call them, and how they're used there. Uh, knowing these terms, what I'm hoping for is it will get us all speaking the same language, um, increase uh, everyone's understanding of rapier, and improve the quality of, a, of the instruction that we get and that we get. Um, we're going to talk about these different topics. So, protective gear. Um, so one thing that I did find out, um, since I mentioned period terminology, I did feel like I need to address this a little bit, which is while in the SCA, uh, we use protective gear, in period, they really didn't. Like if you went to a fencing school, um, they uh, often tipped their swords, like with leather or with some other material. Um, in some cases, they used wooden swords, what they call wooden wasters. I um, mean, later in period, um, they actually specifically made steel long swords that were not meant to be sharpened, it called fetters. Um, but for the most part, uh, you just didn't uh, have protective gear. Um, but a number of manuals um, actually have a statement that basically says, a gentleman never strikes another gentleman in the face. But in the SCA, of course, we use masks or helmets. The mask is what you wear on your head. Um, uh, gorget is what you wear around your neck um, so that you, know, you don't get stabbed in the throat. Um, torso, um, it's so funny, you don't even know what to call torso armor except for that because there's so many different things you can use to cover it. Uh, gowns, dresses, coat, hardies, coats, whichever, um, that all applies. Um, of course, on your hands you need gloves or some kind of gauntlets um, to cover your legs, you know, pants, skirts, dresses, whichever. Um, so, but, but they do need to be at least somewhat protective because we are trying not to actually murder each other. All right, parts of the sword. Um, now there are a lot of pictures out there with lots of different descriptions of parts of the sword. Um, <laughs> but this one I, I thought was like the most clear, just like the picture, I have a pommel, I have a handle, Ooh. I have a knuckle bow, I have keyins, the fancy guard part. This part of the blade is the ricasso. This bit about to here is the forte rest of it is what we call the foible and the tip. And we have what we call the true edge and the false edge. Your true edge is the edge that's in line with your knuckles. So you go, uh, that's the cutty strong part. And the false edge is the other edge where you do your back cuts. Mm. Um, but, and of course, different styles of swords have some different fiddly bits. Like if you look at this one, it's got little clamshells you come across is going to have the all or most of these parts. Um, you will occasionally find some that don't have knuckle bows, like the more of the earlier period ones. Um, but this is pretty much it. When you're taking lessons, um, you know, or, or when you're wor wor working you yourself, your instructor may refer to your true edge, your false edge, your forte, your foible, um, so that they, you can, they can tell you what the, they expect you to do with which part of your sword. You can also... Uh, talk to other fencers about what you like or don't like about your sword or what parts are working or not working or what you expect them to do. Um, so it's really nice to know these terms. Oh, and also say if you want to get fancy and order a custom sword, you know what the parts are. So you know what to ask for. And secondaries. These are the things that you put in your other hand. With an offensive secondary, you can um, both uh, parry with it and strike with it. But with a defensive, you can only defend. Um, you know, you're not, you know, and sometimes you'll see people use some unusual secondaries. Like right here, I got a picture of Nick's really cool uh, lantern shield that he made. This is what we call a non-standard secondary. And if you want to use something weird like this or weird like a bunch of other um, weird secondaries, you need to get uh, the marshals and your opponent's permission. Um, but I really wanted to share uh, Nick's work here because I think it's pretty cool. But we use, you know, uh, different kinds of shields, uh, bucklers, which are kind of smaller shields. Um, the targa is the Italian word basically for their square shaped little shields. And rotellas are much larger. Um, usually I, I, I've seen them as big as uh, 36 inches across, um, but that's a little big. Uh, but they're all acceptable. And you can use capes and cloaks. Like a lot of times you'll see someone swinging a cape around and it's really cool. Uh, but these are all examples of secondary. So if someone comes up and says, 
you know, if you're only using single sword and they say, do you have a secondary? Now you know what they mean. Um, that the, these are the different things you can have in your offhand, whether it's your left hand or your right hand, doesn't matter. I mean, you can um, also use another sword, um, but that's a whole other deal, but it can count as a secondary. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about footwork, and for this, I'm actually gonna get up. So the first thing I wanna talk about, and something that your instructors may mention, is intent. What that means is, your front toe should be pointed towards your opponent. You wanna make sure that it's that way. Because um, if you do this, you're gonna end up hurting your knee. Probably the same if you do this, it's not gonna be particularly helpful. Now, while there are some weirdnesses and some period styles that, that, you know, that talk about maybe pointing your toe a little bit a different direction, for the most part, you wanna keep it pointed at your opponent. That way you can just move right forward and not hurt yourself. And also helps point your sword the correct direction. So if I'm here, right, my foot and my sword pointing the same way. Whereas if I'm doing this, I'm gonna do that. And that's not a good plan. So next I wanna talk about what we call an advance. An advance is where you move your front foot forward first, and then you bring your back foot forward. This is the basic Italian footwork where we just move forward and back. You can do it sideways, forward, forward. Then of course, as I mentioned, you can move backwards. That's the retreat where you wanna move your back foot first. And then there's the lunge. There's a bunch of different ways to lunge. Um, but basically what it means is this or this. It's where you're getting to your full extension and kicking your foot out in some way, shape, or form to get as much dis distance as you can. And then we have what are called gathering steps, which is where you're in your normal stance. You bring your back foot forward towards your front foot and then lunge. What's cool about that is if your opponent doesn't see what you did with your back foot, suddenly you can get a lot closer. <laughs> and then we have passing steps, which is pretty much just like walking. Um, so you're starting in your normal stance, you just bring your back foot in front of it, and then step again. It, uh, although it's slower, it is a more safe and steady way to advance, sometimes than a lunge. And then we have what we call refuse stance, which is where, say if your sword is in your right hand, but you put your left foot in front. And then we have the slanting step, which is basically stepping forward but diagonally. And it is a way to get yourself onto a different line instead of just coming straight forward. So now we're gonna talk about guards and sword positions. And here, here they are, and I'll go ahead and demonstrate them real quick. First, second, third, fourth, and I've talked a little bit about invitations. I mentioned those were the basic sword positions. Um, I did find it a little difficult to find a period image of fencer, uh, of a fencer in fourth or quarta um, in anything but a lunge. Um, so I kind of surmised that it wasn't a way that you sat waiting for people. Uh, it was just something that you went to to do stuff. I mean, the first three images are from the Agrippa Manual, and the fourth is from Captain Farrow. Here's Prima, your sword's up. Second, your sword is out. Point still pointed at your opponent, but you are open. Third is its face generally in, either in front of your leading knee or a little to the outside. And fourth is where you turn your hand over. And so you show this from the sign. First or prima is up here. Second's over here. Third's about here. And fourth's about here. And so why that's important is because, say, when you're learning, um, your instructor may say, well, put your start in third, or they'll say start in second, or start in fourth. You'll know what they mean. 
And also, I did say I want to talk a little bit about in invitations. And really what I mean is sort of more like the openings that you're giving from these positions, just because that also might be important while you're learning. So of course, if you're in Prima, most of you is pretty much open except for your head. So basically what you're saying is, go ahead and try to stab me anywhere but my head. Second, and, you know, and, and in second, you're just, again, you're, hey, I'm open, go right ahead. Third is much more closed up. But note that it's easier to cover just about everything from here. And fourth, like that's kind of a weird, it's a weird way to try to defend from, but it is a good way to stab me. Now we're gonna talk a little about sword work. Thrusts, parries, beats, withdrawing, repost, disengage, and cuts. Cool thing about thrusts is you can do them from any position. You know, even if I'm up here in prima and first, I can thrust from here. I can thrust from second. I can thrust from third. So that's a cool. And basically a thrust, generally, I actually went a little too far into it than I should. It's just moving your arm forward and back. Stab, stab, stab. So the parry is using your sword to stop the other person from hitting you basically by turning your forte into their foible generally. So if someone were trying to hit me, come straight at me, I would just do this or this. And then we have disengages. So what we mean by disengage is, so if you and your opponent are pointing your swords at each other, basically on the same line, you're gonna disengage from that line by moving your sword in a circular motion, either underneath their sword or over it, to change your line of attack. So when someone says disengage, that's what they mean, where they are changing their sword offline. Now, a clever disengage starts on one line and then changes to another one partway through. But sometimes it works just as effectively to do it from the beginning. And then we have cuts. So the thing with cuts is that in rapier, only certain cuts are acceptable. Only certain cuts work. So this is a tip cut with just the tip of your sword across any part of their body. Now what we call a push cut is say you, can, you didn't quite get the thrust for some reason, but your sword kind of touches them and you can push. It's a little bit of a weird cut. It's kind of an SCA weirdness that we allow it. And then we have what we call pull cuts. Say again, you missed your thrust. You went too far past them. You can put your sword against them and pull your sword. And these cuts are, can be executed with different parts of the arm. This is the other three parts I was talking about. You have a cut with the wrist, cut with the elbow, and a cut with the shoulder. Now in rapier, you're not gonna see a lot of cuts with the shoulder because it's a little much. A beat is where you are fighting someone and you just wanna get their sword out of the way. You strike their sword with yours. There's a number of ways you can do it, but you just want to get that sword out of your way to get it offline so you can come in and do something else. That's what we call a beat. And, and to withdraw is just say you're out there and you realize you're out there a little too far or you don't like where the line your sword is on, you just pull it back and redo. You need to be careful with withdrawals because when you bring your arm back, you're of course engaging in all of your arms. You don't want to come forward with all of your strength. But it is a valid way to change your line Maybe for some reason you can't get a disengage because you're a little tangled up. You could just withdraw and come back in. These things I'm going to talk about here, honestly, distance, timing, and measure can all be hour-long classes by themselves. They are wide uh, concepts in rapier. I did want to mention them because they are going to be things that an instructor is going to talk about. So your distance is the length of space between the tip of your sword and your opponent or your target. And it's important as you practice to learn what your distance is, how close you need to be to your opponent or to your training target to hit it, either without a step, with a step, or with a lunge. Because especially for someone like me who's not a taller fencer, it is important for me to know that my distance is much shorter than most of my opponent's distances. Say if Heinrich came back out here with his sword and we stood next to each other with our arms and our swords out, you would see how much further out his sticks than mine. So that is your personal distance. And then there's timing. 
which in general is the amount of time it takes to perform an action and with how many parts of your body. It's also how many movements make up an action. Say a single time action is a thrust or a parry um, or a repost. They can all be done in what's called single time, where all you have to do is move your hand, time of the hand, it's a single time. And then there's a double time actions um, would be say if you parried first and then thrusted, or if you thrusted and then lunged. Um, the, the, those are double time actions. And while slower, it doesn't necessarily mean they're less effective. You just need to figure out when is the most appropriate thing. And so there's also what we talk about as time, as I mentioned, time of the hand, time of the body, and time of the foot. Time of the hand is fastest because you're just moving your hand forward, up, down, whichever. Time of the hand is fastest. Uh, time of the foot actually is probably second fastest because you just you know, move your foot forward or move it back. Time of the body is when you're moving the whole package and that is the slowest. But, but again, slow isn't always bad, but you need to know where you are and what you're doing um, so that you know which thing to move and, and, and what is needed. And then there's measure, which in general is how, is how close you and your opponent are, you and your opponent are to each other. Um, and while many period masters uh, cover hand-to-hand -hand fighting and grappling, we don't do that in the SCA. So our descriptions of measure are a little bit longer than some of them. Like for us, your, our close measure is you're close enough to extend your sword and strike, you, strike your, your opponent, and both of you are that close. So it could be that if Heinrich and I are fighting each other, our measure of close measure, he is gonna, his sword will be, would be at the top of my shoulder if he extended. So that's not always good, good for me. A uh, middle measure is close enough to extend your sword and take a short step um, and still hit your opponent. Um, and again, someone who's taller than me, that measure is gonna be um, a little off for me and my target when we're fighting wouldn't actually be his body necessarily. But when we're talking about the terminology of fencing, that middle measure is I can reach out, take a short step and strike him. And long measure is close enough that you have to lunge to hit your opponent. So that is as far, you know, that is when you're starting a bout with someone, whether it's at practice or at a tournament, unless you're doing a specific drill, you should not be any closer than that. Part of the fun of rapier is figuring out how to get to your right measure and playing with that measure. And that way also you're out of danger. If they have to lunge to hit you and you have to lunge to hit them, you have more time to defend yourself. Um, so, so that is my recommendation. Don't start any closer than whatever your long distance is. And tempo. Note my nice picture of Lizzo down here because she does a really cool song called Tempo. So that's why she's on my slide. But what tempo is, is a combination of time and motion. Is that, and you can't perform more than one more motion during the time required for that motion. For example, once you have chosen and your brain has sent the signal to step forward, you can't step backwards until you've completed that step forwards. That is a tempo. And, or at least you, you probably could pull back, but it's a little awkward. So uh, once you've started the motion, you have to finish that motion. And, and so you can use your opponent's tempo against them. Whereas say, once they've started to thrust, you can interrupt that thrust with a parry. You've taken advantage of their tempo. Or if they start to step forward and now they're close enough for you to hit them, you, you, you strike them. They can't back up before their foot comes down. So that's the very, very simplified explanation of distance, timing, and measure, and tempo. Um, there, there is a lot going on in there. Um, there's a lot of resources where you can read up on these concepts um, so that you can uh, practice it, get, get an idea of it. Um, but really practicing it with a partner is probably the best option, um, just so you can get an idea of where you are and exactly what that means. But I wanted to make sure, because a, a teacher is probably going to talk about these concepts, and now at least you have some idea of what they mean. So now I'm going to talk about some other general concepts. The first concept I want to talk about is zones or lines. So when we're talking about zones, are zones of defensors your opponent's body or your own body, where we have high, we have low, we have left or inside, right and outside. 
So if you're in a medium ward, your inside, your low inside or your low left is somewhat more vulnerable than your low outside or your low right. As you bring it up a little bit, now you can see here, make sure you guys can see what I'm doing here. If I'm in a high ward up here, you know, my, my high line is defended. My low line is open. So your instructor may say, you know, cover your inside line, cover your outside line, bring it up, bring it down. I mean, you can come down to this low guard down here. And <clears throat> there are some instances where it's necessary. But that's basically what those zones and lines are. And so in line and in presence means you're sort of in line or in presence if it is pointing within the outlines of your opponent's body. So I'm gonna pretend I can kind of see myself in the camera that I'm pointing my sword at my opponent, which is me. I'm definitely within presence. So you, you may, you know, and that is your line of attack, unless you move it like I talked about a disengage. And that is your, the presence of your sword. Now the cone of defense, but basically what that is, is if my sword is out here, there's a cone where the tip of my sword is the tip of the cone and extends past, widens out behind me to cover probably about as wide as my shoulders. So the further out I hold my sword, the more time I have to defend because the longer my cone is. And so, and I can parry within that cone, that's my cone of defense. So that's where I can defend. And then when I add a secondary in there, say if I've got a buckler, the further out I hold that buckler, the more time I have to defend because the longer the comb is. And also I want to talk a little bit about gaining the blade. So when someone talks about gaining the blade, what they mean is you have a mechanical advantage over your opponent. Positioning your sword so that your mezzo or your forte, as we talked about earlier, the middle, or the base of your sword is in control of your opponent's foil. So say if I have an opponent, if I'm crossing swords with someone, I want to get it so that either by physical touch or just by positioning on the line, my forte or my mezzo is in control, is either right under or right over their foil, so that I can then control their sword, move it where I want to, and step. So, but that's the very basic of what they mean by gaining the blade. So as I mentioned, this picture here sort of illustrates the cone of defense. I tried to find one that was a little more thorough. They actually showed like a much wider cone, but that was the best one I could find either in my manuals or on the interwebs. And this picture here, he's closer to his forte and he's kind of at, at his mezzo. So he basically has, the, this guy on the right basically has control of this fight. All he has to do is lean forward and he's going to stab the guy in the left in the face. Last thing I want to talk about, um, that of course we all know them, uh, but there are things that you'll want to keep in mind. Um, there's, there's training, which is when you're working with a teacher to learn new things or go over what you learned before, practicing them, learning new stuff. I mean, anyone can be a teacher in this context. You don't have to be someone's student to learn from them. Drilling is a little bit separate from training. Drilling is the practice you do afterwards. Um, where you uh, practice your footwork or your sword work or your parries, or you get um, a, a partner drill where you can work on um, plays from period manuals. That's something I could have talked about. When we say plays from period manuals, what we mean is you've looked at a manual and it describes a series of actions. Sometimes it's only um, one fighter does one thing and then the other one does the other thing to respond and that's it. Um, some plays are like, 10 actions. Like if you read Saviolo, there's like eight or 10 actions in some of those plays. Uh, but that's what we mean, um, is, is that these are ways to demonstrate how that particular style works and also ways to learn how that style works by, by repeating those patterns so that when you fight an opponent, they're not going to cooperate with whatever you think is supposed to be done in that play. <laughs> but if you've done enough practice, you can make it work the way you want it to and stab them. And so of course, drilling can be guided or independent. And then there's sparring. That's where you put that training and drilling to the test with a partner. Um, you can do it full speed or slow, 
um, as, as you and your opponent try out different actions and reactions. It doesn't necessarily have to be trying to win fighter practice. Um, while you do want to learn to be successful with, with, with your actions, you know, you want to concentrate on making your plans come to fruition more than just stabbing them. At least I find that more useful than just going out there to prove I'm the best fence around in, in the fighter practice, Eric. Because that doesn't really help me when I go other places if I don't understand how I did it. Then, of course, there's teaching, as sharing what you know with those who will listen. I mean, not everyone comes to practice to learn. I um, you know some people just want to come and stab their friends and uh, joke around or, or they're in a bad mood and they need to let off some steam. Totally fine. Um, you know, it, it, it's not, you know, don't be judgmental of someone who's not interested in learning that day. They, they may have a number of reasons. They might feel like they, they're not in a mental place to absorb the information. It's fine. But teaching is another aspect of practice um, that either you can teach, if you've learned something that you think is cool take the time to teach someone else who wants to know it. It's going to reinforce that message for you. And then it's also going to help them get better to give you a better fight. And also if you can explain it, then you probably understand it pretty well. Thanks guys for your time. Thank you very much.